Hi, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Arko Dotto as the visiting artist and photography at the Yale School of Art. It is my belief that Arko's work is where the cutting edge of visual representation is at the moment. In terms of tradition, imagination, composition, and an acute sensibility to what is unfolding around them, while being aware of a global epochal and semiotic significance. Working in multimedia, Orko pursues narratives on seemingly disparate topics, forced migration, surveillance in the digital panopticon, disappearing islands, nocturnal realms, and psychotomatic stress of captive animals to state a few. As a curator, artist, and educator, Orko, born 1986, is in dialogue with the photo community and the world while advocating for awareness. He's based in Kolkata, India. Orko was on the curatorial team of the recently concluded Chennai Photo Biennial, and his work has been exhibited and published globally. Thank you, and please welcome Orko Dutt. Thank you so much. So just to introduce myself um, a bit more after Omorto's great introduction, um, I primarily work as a photographer, and lately I've been working more with moving image and installations as well. Uh, I primarily develop long-term projects over the course of um, multiple years. And um, what I would like to share with you today is uh, a trilogy. It's called the Shunno Raja Monographies. And it's a project that I've been developing since 2014. It's been eight years that I've been uh, developing it. And uh, the, the project looks at um, climate change in the Bengal Delta. It's the space where I come from and where I work um, as an artist as well. So just to, before we get into that, I'd like to start with a quote from um, one of my favorite authors, uh, Amitav Ghosh, who wrote in a recent book that he published called The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable. When future generations look back upon the great derangement, they will certainly blame the leaders and politicians of this time for their failure to address the climate crisis. But they may well hold artists and writers equally culpable for the imagining of possibilities is not, after all, the job of politicians and bureaucrats. So just before we start, I'll give you a lay of the land where uh, I've been developing these projects. Uh, this is roughly Eastern India, the Eastern subcontinent that you see here. Um, in the north of the image is the Himalayan mountain range. And you see all these great rivers uh, flowing down from these mighty uh, ranges. And you have the Brahmaputra, the Ganga, the Yamuna, and all these rivers that end up flowing into the Gangetic Delta, which is in the, roughly in the middle of the, of the image. Um, a lot of it, a big chunk of that space is, uh, the, is in Bangladesh, which is uh, what once the land was partitioned back in 1947, um, a majority of it became Bangladesh and a part of it got um, included in India. And that's where I come from in West Bengal. So... Um, borders have been a major issue for us. There has been uh, multiple waves of uh, partic multiple waves of refugees that have crossed borders on both sides. Uh, it has been also very difficult in terms of photography um, to look at that space. It's become a fractured landscape, much like the entire region has become in a post-colonial state. Um, so with in the current times, what has happened with increasing climate change is you see this entire region being sandwiched between two very strong hydrological forces. You have the increasing glacial meltwater coming from the north and uh, sort of flooding, uh, flooding this landscape, while you also have the sea levels rising from the south. So essentially um, sandwiching this region between these forces. On top of that, you have increased uh, ferocity and intensity of cyclones uh, that have also been hitting the land in recent times. So Making it, this is a close-up of that space. Um, as you can see, uh, it's crisscrossed by these rivers and there are these multiple islands. In the center of this image is the Sundarbans, which is the, the mangrove, which is considered the largest mangrove region in the world. It's This entire region is home to millions of people and um, with increasing um, and exacerbating climate change, the, street, the people would be forced to move away. The only problem is that in the Indian subcontinent, there is no space where they can move to. So we are looking at a crisis of epic proportions in the coming days um, in this region, which is considered one of the ground zeros of climate change. 
So um, I will uh, share images from my first project in this uh, trilogy. Um, what I essentially want to do is propose three different ways of looking at and looking and studying the same side of climate change, which in this case happens to be the Bengal Delta. So the first project is called Kings of a Bereft Land. Um, Shunno Raja is a term that one, one um, climate refugee I met some time back uh, said to me um, that we have become um, empty kings in this in this land of plenty. So what happens is once the land which is very fertile gets lost to climate change in various forms, um, it leads to immediate impoverishment. This first image that you see here, um, you see a, a village on the border of the sea and you can see three levels of degradation in the images. On the right side, you have a, a tenement which is completely destroyed. In the middle is one which is in the process of getting destroyed. And on the left side is a building where people, is, is a hut where people are still living. This image was taken right after one storm abated. And you can see like the footprints in the, in the watery sandscape tells you of the, of the life that is lived in this region right now. This is an image of a lady whose portrait I took at this point where she was living towards the left side of this image in a temporary embankment shelter. And uh, this is the village where her home was and um, got lost to climate change. Um, when I went back, I could not trace her anymore. Um, to say that these were very strong communities at some point, like in the villages, there are very strong communities and once climate change um, destroys the land, the people are forced to move away elsewhere, breaking those ties. And um, nobody could tell me where she had gone, which would have been quite rare under normal circumstances. This is a man I, I found while I was photographing in the region. And um, I, I, this image is from a point where he was taking a break between transporting his belongings from his home towards the left of the image that got destroyed and he was taking it to uh, his daughter's home for temporary shelter. You see from the image that he is in a very emaciated state. I understood from what he was telling me that he was suffering from um, some sort of blood disease. And the next time I went back, um, I could not find him anymore. He had passed away. And um, people who live in these lands, once they lose every once they lose their land they kind of lose the found the foundation of their economy and the impoverishment is completely he could not go for treatment and uh, so i was uh, these are spaces that i keep going back to and you you would see in the course of the of the images how that sort of trajectory is built uh, this is an image where the the towards the later half of the image you see the sea has come in and um, the lady is waiting with her grandson for the water to abate so that they can come on this side. And um, on the right side of the image, you see a hand pump which delivers fresh water and um, technically surrounded by seawater on all sides. And you can see the level of the hand pump which was here and now it's gone down to a pretty alarming level. Um, so the one once climate change starts working, it leaves these very um, strong signifiers in the landscape, and that's what interests me in these images. Um, as you see, the project comprises landscapes, and then uh, where the the people are sort of pitted against this vast, expensive landscape and the forces of nature, and then I um, go from that to the portraits where I bring them out and their and bring their stories in full relief. This is an image where you see multiple levels of degradation. Uh, you see the embankment near the sea, which is a failed project. Towards the foreground of the image, you see a new embankment, which is also in a process of degradation. And uh, in all along the image are littered these piles of wood, which is also from another uh, afforestation program, which failed. And now the authorities were selling that wood for, um, for a pittance. So essentially, um, you see multiple levels of like failures on um, in in the level of government policy. Why I say that is, um, 
I the the work that you see here is and the work that you would see later on is largely inspired by um, uh, an Israeli American philosopher called Adi Ofer who uh, who speaks about this idea of catastrophization as a political and a philosophical theory where a uh, catastrophe is uh, something uh, uh, cata- um, where the catastrophe does not happen so let's say a genocide would not take place but people are pushed to the brink of that so the the catastrophe is kept in abeyance yet the people are in this regime or this paradigm of catastrophization so um of course he talks about that in in the in the space or in the context of more um of um of conflict zones um, spread across the world uh, what i wanted to do is to see how catastrophization theory lends itself to a space of climate change so here what you see are these various the ways in which the government and governmental agencies uh, contractors on a local level sort of collude to create a situation where they make the projects but they don't make them good enough they make them bad enough so that they break down and they get a new contract the next year so the only ones who lose out are the people who live in the villages but the rest a lot of people kind of end up seeing a handsome profit being made so i like to look at these various narratives of climate change that are playing all around simultaneously this is an image of a group of young madrasa students from the islamic school um, in a small island in bangladesh and um, here they were on um, on a collection effort to collect fish from the incoming fishermen and uh, i took this image when it started raining and uh, they had still not gathered much it's a poor region and uh, their subsistence is largely predicated by how much uh, food they can how much support or donation they can gather from various sources from this image of the boys in bangladesh um, i moved to another image of a group of kids from india and a similar setting but widely different context i would say um where um the school that of this village um broke down at the very moment that this image was taken and i mean i just ended up by chance i would let's say uh being in the zone and um and then these three boys who studied in the school before went to sort of explore that zone and see what's up and um that's when i took this image you can see the full ferocity of uh, uh of the waves um, in this image of course schools are schools are a motive that i explore in these works quite often as schools double as cyclone shelters in most villages where people live in mud huts and in temporary settlements it is a school that provides the sort of um, space for respite a space for the community once that breaks down you really know that the village will cease to be in that form anymore this is the same uh, this image has that same building but from a couple of years back in the backdrop and in the foreground you see the villagers who were agricultors before um but they ended up becoming fishermen once uh, and dependent on fish more importantly once uh once their lands once their agricultural lands were lost the building ends up becoming um i would say a silent actor but silent yet powerful actor in my in my project where you see it degrading over the course of multiple years and uh, as so as in this image where this lady is waiting in front of um, the same uh, dilapidated building um and uh, she's waiting for these different pieces of fire wood to come floating back so that she can take it back for fuel to use at home this is a man who is uh, using his memory to think of the spots where there would have been sources of wood and he's trying to extricate the, that wood from the land that previously was his home and now it's gone to the sea completely and in this very marshy and strange landscape he is extricating the wood to use as fuel of course it's very difficult to be to be able uh, for him to um, afford um, will of other means so this is the only option that he has for his sustenance this is actually an island which is disappearing at, 
an extremely fast rate and within the next couple of decades would cease to be. And its population has already reduced to one third from what it was a couple of decades back. Memory plays a very strong role like the other image where people were looking at going back into their memory to find where memories of wood, if I could call it that way in this image, the memory of the, of the village is imprinted in the landscape itself. What you see in the backdrop of this lady uh, is basically the pool from the village uh, where this lady used to live before. Uh, you see the clump of trees that were once the borders of, the, of one of the village ponds and now it's become a completely eroded, degraded landscape filled with sand and unfit for human habitation. I found this family um, tending to their boat while all around them is a flood plain. Um, so it kind of felt on a more evocative plane like Noah's Ark, like a mini Noah's Ark, if we could call it in terms of them preparing for a possible journey away from these lands that have um, recently been so difficult for them to live on. The idea of the boat is something that I keep coming back to. Um, Michel Foucault, the French philosopher, talks about the boat being the heterotopia par excellence. So it is um, the vessel that transports people from one world to another. And in, in these contexts of climate change, perhaps the boat would lead people from their very difficult present to a better future. In this image, you see a boat coming from one island to another, which is a pretty remote landscape, rendered even more remote by the fact that boats are few and far in between. So even though the, you can see the island on the other side, um, back when this image was taken, there was only one boat per day coming and going. So if you miss that boat, you would probably have to wait for the next day uh, to be able to you know, cross over. So a lot of this land was because of the in, because of the intensity of the, the ferocity of the waves during uh, during the monsoons during the very strong and very long monsoons um, a lot of this region is rendered very difficult and inaccessible yet it is very strongly populated because of the fertility of the land and that's what creates the complexity in terms of needing to shift these people in the coming decades this is an image of a man carrying a god um, kartik Thakur on his head um, from one island to the other. Rituals and customs dictate that he is not allowed to put the god down from his head uh, before he reaches home. For me, this image kind of became testimony uh, of the fact that even while the gods have left these, or the gods seem to have left these lands, people are trying to cling on to them for, for hope and other possibilities. This image is from uh, one of the islands we were seeing on the map. The, the region where the Ganga River meets the sea is a very holy point, uh, is a holy place in Hindu religion. Um, and millions of pilgrims congregate on this one particular island every year in the month of January to take a holy dip, which is supposed to rid them of all their sins. Um, while climate change is ravaging this landscape, the presence of millions of tourists, pilgrims during those particular during that particular week, also puts an immense anthropogenic stressor on that island. So, for example, the amount of E. coli in the water around this area gets one of the highest concentrations in the world for a few uh, for a few months. And by the time that E. coli concentration goes back to normal, it's time again for the next pilgrimage. This is an image from a really small, very tiny island in, in Bangladesh, which uh, probably has lost more than half the land uh, by the time, since the time that I took this image. Of course, I've not been able to go back to Bangladesh where I travel frequently because of the pandemic in the last two, two and a half years. Um, in this image, um, I found these two men sort of sitting very gracefully on this um, chopped off tree trunk. And uh, it reminded me of, it brought, home the fact that 
the people in this land have very beautiful, graceful features. You know, they they live in fluidity with the landscape, with the waters that surround them, and you kind of see that fluidity of form in this particular image. This is a man, dare I say, an ad a young uh, adolescent teenager, sorry, um, who um, I had been meeting for many years before. And I had never taken an image before. This was the only time I took an image at the very moment where his house, which is on the left of this image, got destroyed by the force of these, um, by the force of these waves that you see here. Um, yet, like he was waiting and seeing the, the sea gradually approaching in the years preceding this. And you see in his form, like there is a strong resilience, yet a sort of resignation to what the future holds for him and his family. This is an image of a lady whose um, house, as you can see, has been flooded by the sea coming in from all sides. And her husband was working um, in, in, uh, outside the frame on the right side and she was taking his lunch. He was preparing, he was reinforcing the embankments to prevent the village from getting flooded. And she was, uh, I took this image of her at the moment when she was taking lunch out to him. This is a family that I photographed who were um, for the past three days moving house. The, what you see here was their village before. And um, for the last three days while they were shifting home, um, this lady who happens to be the matriarch of the family was kind of sitting on one side in one corner of the, of the room, um, largely ignored by the very busy activities going on all around her. On this day when it was time for her to be shifted out, uh, you see her bedecked in a beautiful white new sari. And, uh, and this is her grandson who is very delicately carrying her from her old home to her new space. And you see in her expression this sort of sadness yet excitement at you know um, going to her new home. I end this first chapter in the trilogy with this image, which is sort of a very uh, sort of this magical moment that I came upon, where this family was trying to erect this pole um, in this village, which has been completely decimated by by the rising sea levels in Bangladesh. And uh, here you see them sort of pitted in this sort of very um, Promethean task of setting up their very delicate uh, bamboo pole. So from this, um, I would go to the second chapter, which is called, Where Do We Go When the Final Wave Hits? So while I was doing this, uh, the project that you saw right now, um, a lot of people started describing to me the fact that it is actually at night that um, the real terror begins. A lot of the time people have recounted me stories of them going to sleep and then waking up in the morning and seeing their, half their village gone or half their family has been washed away, leaving no trace. Um, and I kind of realized, started realizing that at night, the water becomes the veritable sort of symbol of terror, you know, and, um, and it is one of those things that the Bengal Delta is, I mean, in the cities you have electricity, but in a lot of these spaces, you are face to face with pure, pristine, black darkness. And in such a space, the water does become the symbol of terror. And what I started thinking about was, um, you know, we um, in in the world we talk, we have been talking a lot about this global war on terror, and now we speak of, um, of course, in the last two years we've seen the global war against the pandemic, and in between we've seen the global war against climate change. Let's say so. I wanted to. So we are always using these um, these ideas of the war, um, and we are trying to deal with these sort of um, planetary phenomena on a war footing. So um, I wanted to see if there is some way where I could uh, look into climate change as, as seen from a sort of conflict zone or 
standpoint. So trying to build an equivalence between, or a, a visual and conceptual equivalence between the war on terror and the war against climate change, where we see only at night, essentially, I mean, in the war against terror, you are face to face with an omnipotent, omnipresent enemy that could theoretically strike at any point, anywhere at any point of time. And the water in these lands of climate change, especially in the Bengal Delta, came to signify one such power, you know? So, um, so what you see right now is the second chapter where um, I am looking at um, essentially the climate change lands at nighttime. It's a flash photography project, um, project use done using flash at nighttime. So it's more confrontational, it's more close up, it's more intense. Um, and uh, yeah, let's, uh, so what you see here, I hope the sound would be running. Um, it's, a, it's a short piece, like I wanted to, I, we created like a audio visual presentation where uh, there is a soundscape from, collated from uh, sounds from the Delta and then the images come with that. So I hope the sound is working. Here we go. So that was a that was a, a selection of images from the the second project. Um, what is interesting for me in this project is that uh, 
I, the first project automatically leads to the second one and then the second one to the third one. And the third one is called Terra Mutata. Um, and it's a project where, give me a second. Um, so the first project automatically kind of uh, intrinsically led to the second one. And uh, from the second one, I come to the third project where I wanted to further explore this idea of, uh, of, the, of the climate change zone as a zone of, as a zone, as a conflict zone, let's say. And um, I was automatically, um, so we'll come to that. Um, before we go that, I'll seg uh, through a small little, Sub chapter I made. This is a project. It's I'll just show you like five or six images from um, this. It's a project. Uh, it's a small project where uh, I was. You know, a lot of these lands are fairly intractable, and Google Maps has become very important. And I would say, like for me, has been indispensable to discover even discovering new spaces, at, at least as far as Bangladesh is concerned. And um, um, while I was using it, I realized that there are many spaces where um, Google Maps has failed to update the, the lands that have been lost to climate change. And um, so when you see the maps and you switch on, you toggle between the different formats, you see these lands sort of sticking out into the water, like you see in this image. And uh, that kind of became a very, uh, it's, a, it's a ghostly reference to, to what once was. And that memory somehow has remained on, on, on social media, on, on the digital realm. So this work kind of like situates itself at that intersection of digital memory and climate change. Right. Here are a few other images. Very, um, I wanted to look. I the presentation here is imagining the um, the maps looked at at nighttime as well. That's why you see this visualization. So with that, I come to the first image in the third chapter, Terra Mutata. Uh, this is a project where I've been uh, developing using uh, infrared and full spectrum camera. So this work is very much, it's very different from the second project, which is more sort of confrontational. Uh, I go out, I seek people, I seek subjects, I go up close and you know, it's, it's a lot of action. It's a lot of energy uh, in the images. Um, heightened by the flash. This, in, this project is uh, much slower. It's kind of like large format photography, I would imagine, where you know, you're setting the tripod and you're putting the camera and you, it takes a lot of time to get the light straight um, in working with infrared cameras. Um, I wanted to push, of course, infrared photography has been used in uh, primarily as a method in military surveillance technologies and climate zones and for other surveillance purposes. So it has been a tool um, used by the powers that be. So I wanted to see how uh, we could create a representation of this climate change zone as a war zone through infrared photography. So in this image, we'll speak more about that. In this image, what you see is an embankment, a very rickety embankment at that. And uh, I found this one family living on uh, on stilts, as it were, and basically the sea comes in and floods the entire space and then goes. Um, later, when I went back, I could not find his family anymore. What's interesting in this image is the, the long exposure also registered the, the passage of an aeroplane in the, in the top of the image and um, essentially bringing or um, how could we say, like compressing the narrative of the people who are sort of guzzling the carbon economy and the people who are bearing the brunt of, of the carbon economy that we are living in. 
So sort of bringing all of that together in the same image. This is an image where um, you see trees that have been lost to the sea. They have died because of the increasing salinity and you see a person in that landscape. People from the village. A lot of the times what I'm exploring in this particular um, project is sort of this idea of the apparition, the ghost-like or spectral presence of, of people and ruins and landscapes, uh, people and uh, buildings in, in this sort of landscape of degradation. Um, these are this image of two men surveying a building that has ceased to be uh, functional anymore. And there are constantly people in some 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 of these spaces have to constantly survey, keep surveying the the levels lest they destroy uh, their homesteads. I am reminded of um, Giorgio Agamben, the Italian philosopher, and the way he describes bare life. A lot of the and I mean bare life is very intrinsically tied with the idea of the catastrophization processes that we were talking about before and. Um, a lot of the people here, they are living lives in a in a bare life form, you know, where they have to constantly, like their lives revolve around the presence and the uh, the way the tides come in and the way the they are very much left to uh, the vagaries of the elements um, and uh, leaving them with little to th be able to imagine a life or other things in life. So they're constantly on the lookout for for their protection from the elements. In this image, you see um, a tomb, which is the last remaining um, vestige of the village resting at this point on a sliver of land between the two bodies of water. So the river has come in on this side as well. And uh, that is normally the, the tombs are placed at the, the safest uh, points or the highest points of the village. And basically once that is gone, you would know that the village has ceased to exist. Um, this is an image of a cyclone shelter. I am very much uh, upset. I'm, I'm quite obsessed with these structures, which are these sort of modernist buildings that are littered very much across the Bangladeshi landscape. They kind of look like these very um, A.G. Wells, War of the Walls, uh, War of the Worlds kind of uh, buildings on these legs standing. Um, and in this image, like normally the cyclone shelters are uh, are buildings that are also built on the highest or the safest, safest point in the in the village. In this image, you see it standing in the water. So most of the village has been lost, and um, and very soon this would also go. And you see, like people have broken the stairs so that people don't go in and try to live in this building, even though they might need to. Going back to the motif of the ship, um, during one cyclone, and cyclones have been very frequent in this region in the last four years, there have been five, super, five uh, two of them were super cyclones and three were strong cyclones. Um, and during one such, this uh, container got untethered from its mothership. And the people from this village, they thought perhaps they might find something valuable contained therein. So they tugged it back to their, um, to their village and you can see in this image like they try to pry it open on the left side on the bottom of the image you have like markings of them trying to open it they found only the container containing cotton but that too in a very soggy state so they abandoned their hopes of uh, you know trying to open this anymore and right now it stands like this gigantic sort of industrial artifact in this very rural setting because nobody's going to move it out anymore and uh, testament to uh, to the ship's testament to the cyclones that have hit this land. This is an image of um, a point where the, the road caved in. And um, I found this very surreal setting where this boy was passing under um, one of the shops.
people, of course, try to protect their homes the best they can. Um, I would imagine that this family has no resources left to be able to get that protection done in proper ways. So they got, they collected twigs uh, and branches and, 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 and created this reinforcement um, to protect them from the incoming waters. This is an image where you see the curious way in which um, things work in the Indian subcontinent. The entire land has been cleared um, and been protected with these uh, pixelated blocks, uh, but they left this one lone tree standing in the middle of all that concrete. Three years, um, four, five years back, there was the massive exodus of refugees from Myanmar to Bangladesh. This image is taken at the very point, which is its land's end in Bangladesh. So it is at the point where the, the sea, the, the land meets the sea and on the other side is Myanmar. Uh, and this is where a majority of the refugees, the Rohingyas were, uh, were coming, seeking shelter and seeking respite from the genocide, the onslaught that was going on in Myanmar. And this was kind of the point at which this was, uh, that their embarkation was happening. Uh, what you see here is a watchtower that was created to monitor that, uh, that influx, that exodus. And when I shot this image a couple of years back, uh, that exodus had died down. So the watchtower ceased to function. So they cut down the uh, the, the the stairs leading up to it, yet uh, this uh, and the exodus has taken been taken over by an incoming trade of drugs um, in a village which is also being at Land's End, also a land where the village has been completely decimated because of the rising sea level. So for me, this image kind of is where all the forces and all the things that I was thinking of regarding um, the climate change, the war zone, and uh, you know all of that sort of came together in um, in this one image. We also saw images of these boats, these uh, crescent-shaped boats that were transporting the 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 Rohingyas fleeing Myanmar. And um, at this point, I found these boats uh, due to this infrared camera rendered very beautiful with these very surreal colors under a starry sky. This is uh, from a mosque in, uh, in, in a village in Bangladesh where the, the person on the right, the person on the left is the imam and on the left, on the right is the only person who is attending this mosque anymore. So these two people come every day, open the mosque, offer their prayers and then leave. So it's a, it's a space, as you can see, it's all like the bricks are all lying around. It's a landscape of desolation. And these two people are constantly sort of uh, bless the space with their lingering presence. They refuse to leave this land. This is a group of, uh, of family that was returning home. In this image, you see the, the, the cliff face sort of breaking down and that's also another mosque, which is uh, very soon going to slide down. I keep going back to this idea of the religion because uh, this land, which once was a very syncretic space, uh, the Bengal Delta had been after partition, um, it kind of ceased to be that. And right now we are facing sort of increased fundamentalism. Uh, Bangladesh is a Muslim majority nation, whereas Bengal on the Indian side is predominantly Hindu. And um, those narratives, the narratives of religion keep, um, keep, uh, seeping or making their way into into these two project into these three projects this is a, a space normally it's a very flat landscape everything is at mean sea level you know like that's how flat the bengal delta is barring this one spot where uh, where the river sort of takes a bend one of the rivers takes a bend and created this sort of uh, cliff face and people people were living there for the longest time and uh, only recently it has started caving in and this image is taken from the bottom of the cliff and you see uh, that entire sp space in, in layers, the, the layers of that, the collapse of 
that uh, that landform and the the light that is emanating is from the building that is right now at the at the edge of at the rim of the of that cliff face during one such cyclone um, villages in bengal on the indian side three villages were completely uh, i mean a, a big region was completely decimated i wanted to look at one such space where um, you know the, the 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 people of the villages gathered in these communities. They kind of came together to create these communal kitchens where um, they would eat and sort of provide support to each other. While the men would go back to tend to the house and sort of make a space, safe space for for the people to kind of go back and live because everything had been completely destroyed. Um, so this is an image where, ironically, the the main tree of the village is where they had set up that sort of uh, shelter or the kitchen, the community kitchen, and you see that tree has sort of broken down, destroyed by the very severe gusts of wind. Another image from another community kitchen, which uh, came into force because of, um, and here you see all the women sort of come together, um, trying to prepare food for the community at large, while some women take care of their babies. And The infrared camera, the, the infrared light in this case, um, I just found very beautiful and quite in opposition to the other project where um, people are unaware of the, you know, the presence of the camera. So it lets you do things in a, in a way that might have been impossible otherwise. This is a broken down terminal, a ship terminal. I was saying that I, I keep obsessing over these uh, cyclone shelters. So here I found one, uh, slightly different in shape and form, but kind of similar nonetheless. But here I found a family that was living in one of these rooms upstairs. While that was, I mean, it's illegal to do so, but they were because they did not have any space to go. So this is an image of such. I think uh, for me, like I, this project kind of tries to look at these spectral presences. Uh, the Bengal Delta, in a sense, has been, it's a, it's a region which historically or traditionally has been rich, very rich with uh, folklore, talking about ghosts. Ghosts in Bengali literature play a very rich role. If you go and search for Bengali ghosts on Wikipedia, you will see an entire compendium of, um, you know, like a glossary of like Hindu ghosts, Muslim ghosts, ghosts with feedback words, uh, ghosts of the graveyard, fish eating ghosts, like there's, you know, an entire multiverse of um, ghosts. So I think with this project, I was trying to look at, sort of bring that idea to the fore of like looking at the people that become these lingering spectral presences in the landscape because of their inability to, um, to you know, to extricate themselves to go to a better space. So that's something that I'm trying to look at through this project. This is a family, uh, a couple, whose house was on the left side, it, it collapsed into the waters. And uh, in this image, you see a multitude of different lights playing. So like five or six light sources uh, are illuminating this particular image, quite fond of it. At, in places, for example, in this image, people had been rehabilitated from another village that was um, that got eroded and lost to the waters, but you see the place, space that they were rehabilitated to, to has also been, um, is also slowly going to the waters. So people end up suffering multiple waves of these dislocations, reinforcing their sort of uh, homelessness, if I could say so. This is a man where an embankment has broken down and um, the man is sort of um, taking the bricks from that embankment to reinforce his own house while the embankment is breaking down. So there is a weird narrative at play here where, I mean, the, this is the only option left for him to reinforce his home while at the same time, the embankment that was supposed to prevent his home from degrading is getting degraded. So a lot of these small things keep playing out in, uh, in different spaces. Um, another home, I mean, for me, like, I think uh, I try to bring out more and more of these stories because that's sort of 
the 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 repetition is slightly important because they they tell similar stories yet each story is different from the other you know so and um, that it is important to give dignity to uh, uh, to these different stories which are at the same time similar yet same same yet different let's say uh, the infrared photography here sort of the way the light is emanating from that building actually makes the building look very ethereal, very delicate. And you see the building situated at water's edge. Um, the last time I went here, this building had ceased to be. Adi Ofer also in his book on catastrophization talks about the idea of these mercenaries who are these ghost-like apparitions that come visiting upon a village at night. And uh, you know they attack the village, they, they rape village plunder, and they leave before leaving any trace. And uh, and kind of in a sense, like um, with climate change, it's a very similar kind of thing that happens with the water. This is a school in Bangladesh that was also doubled as a cyclone shelter and uh, at this point is completely in ruins. What is interesting in this image is the light that you see, this very sort of apocalyptic nuclear light that is emanating from the backdrop is from a new nuclear, uh, is from a new coal-based thermal power plant that has been opened in Bangladesh. So while the prime minister goes public, uh, goes abroad saying that, you know, Bangladesh is the ground zero of climate change and uh, we require all the help, on a local level, they are opening up new thermal power plants all over the space. And this is one such, this is example from one such space. If uh, the historian uh, Deepesh Chakraborty from Chicago has, uh, um, who has been one of the foremost uh, theoreticians of um, commentators on climate change, he talks about in, in one of his essays, he talks about climate change being a, uh, at its origin, a study of planets, a study of planetary scale. When NASA was doing the research, they were actually studying Mars and Venus. They were studying runoff uh, heat phenomena on Mars and Venus. And then they saw that they, that could be adapted to study and understand the Earth better. So um, with this third project that you see here, a lot of them have these stars. They are very beautiful. The, the images have the sort of jarring beauty in them where um, the settings are under a starry sky. So what I want to do really is to bring back that discourse of climate change where the first project started from a very localized level of the Bengal Delta. And from there, we actually move to a space where that entire phenomena of climate change and where that stands is brought back, or it is my intention to bring it back to that planetary level where it rightfully belongs. Um, a macrocosmic understanding of these various localized perspectives is really required to bridge together and bring a proper understanding of where we need to go in the future. And I end my presentation with an image of another boat, which is clearly not going anywhere for the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arko, for such a poignant, moving, very revelatory experience.